All right, so today we're going to get into the thermodynamic aspects of all of the great, wonderful stuff we learned on Monday, right? So we hinted at it a little bit on Monday. We talked about whether or not um, a cell reaction is spontaneous by looking at E-cell, but we're gonna go much further than that today. So if you don't have your standard reduction potentials handy, go ahead and pull those out because you're going to need them today. So like, we can't forget Gibbs free energy, right? Anytime we talk thermodynamics, Gibbs free energy needs to come into the picture, okay? Because Gibbs free energy tells us quantitatively, is this spontaneous or is this non-spontaneous? So under standard conditions, remember we talked about what standard conditions meant a long time ago, we refreshed our memory on Monday, concentration of one molar, temperature 25 degrees Celsius, right? So if we're at one molar concentration at 25 degrees Celsius, under standard conditions, delta G is negative, that negative is built in, N, where N is the number of moles of electrons transferred. How do you get that? That's the number of electrons. So right, if I have X plus 2E minus, and then I have Y going to blah, 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 plus 2E minus, right? The number that I cancel out, that would be two times Faraday's constant, which we talked about on Monday when we did electrochemical work, and it's 96,485 coulombs per mole. And then this is just E cell, which we learned how to calculate on Monday. Right? So again, that's why we need to uh, have our standard reduction potentials handy. All right, so delta G, is it positive or negative for a spontaneous process? It's what? For a spontaneous process, delta G is negative. We want delta G to be negative if this is a spontaneous process. What about E cell? If E cell is positive, is that spontaneous? Yes. E cell and delta G should be opposite each other. Okay, if for a spontaneous cell reaction, you have a negative delta G and a positive E cell. Those two are opposites each other. All right, because if you have a negative number in here, a negative of a negative will give you a positive. And if you have a positive number in here, the negative of positive will give you a negative. So E cell and delta G should always be opposite signs of each other. So this is what I just said, negative delta G is spontaneous, right? That's what we want. Um, because if you have a non-spontaneous cell, right, you're gonna have to add effort to it. So for instance, when you charge your battery, that's non-spontaneous, right? You have to apply electricity in order to charge your battery, right? You can't just charge your battery without electricity. That's non-spontaneous. So if you want your battery to work spontaneously, you want it to have a negative delta G. And then also, just so like I said, anytime you have a negative delta G, that's gonna correspond to a positive value for each cell. Those two go hand in hand. So how do we do this? We're gonna balance the redox reaction, just like we did last week. We're gonna figure out how many electrons get transferred because that's the number that we cross out. We're gonna calculate E cell, there should be a degree sign there, right? Because again, this is under standard conditions. So we need to have that degree sign there. E cell without the degree sign means under non-standard conditions, which we'll also talk about today. So we need to calculate E cell. And then we'll solve for delta G. All right, so let's do this one together. Calculate delta G for this reaction, and I'm telling you it's occurring in acidic solution, and determine if it is spontaneous. All right, so first thing we need to do is what? We gotta give everybody oxidation numbers, right? So we go through oxygens minus two in both cases, so that's why I'm ignoring it. And so the reduction, and the oxidation, right? I've just balanced it for you because we've already talked about how to balance an acidic solution. So I went ahead and balanced it for you, right? You balance the oxygens with H2O, you balance the hydrogens with H plus. We learned that last week. So three electrons, three electrons. So how many electrons get transferred in this reaction? Three, right? Because the number that I cancel out is the number of electrons transferred. So the answer, for number of electrons transferred would be three. Okay, and so there's my final balanced cell reaction. Once we add these two up, 
electrons cancel, that gives me my final balanced cell reaction. So this is exactly what we did last week. <clears throat> now we're going to calculate E cell. The nitrogen process is the cathode, and the silver, or excuse me, the gold process is the anode reaction. How do you know which one's cathode and which one's anode? Which one's cathode, which one's anode? How do you know? The red cat, right? Reduction occurs at the cathode. So we look at our chart, which you should have handy. Again, if you need a half reaction that isn't on here, look it up in the appendix in the back of your book. Or are there about a gazillion of these standard reduction potential tables online? These are just the most common ones. And both of these are on our chart. So we've got 1.5, which is right there. And we've got 0.96, which is right there. So we just do cathode minus anode to get E cell. Again, this is under standard conditions. So we get negative 0.54 volts. So just by looking at E cell, we should be able to predict is this spontaneous or not. We've got a negative E cell. So before we even calculate delta G, we should know if this is spontaneous or not. What is this going to be? Negative E cell means that it is Non-spontaneous, right. But let's take it another step further just to confirm that because we need to calculate delta G as well. When we calculate delta G, delta G is negative N times Faraday's constant times E cell. N here is how many electrons that got transferred, which is three. F is Faraday's constant, which will be given on your reference page. Okay, it's 96,485 but uh, I will give it to you on your reference page. E cell, we just calculated. So three moles of electrons times Faraday's constant, coulombs per mole. And then a volt is the same thing as a joule per coulomb. That's how we're able to make this substitution. Okay, the volt is the same thing as a joule per coulomb. That's how my coulombs cancel. And that's how my moles of electrons cancel. And that's how I'm left with units of joules. Okay, so if you're wondering how did I go from volts the joules per coulomb, that's the definition of the volt. So we get a positive value of delta G, and we had a negative value of E cell. So both of these should lead us concluding that this is a what kind of reaction? Spontaneous or non-spontaneous? We should conclude based on the positive delta G and the negative E cell that this is non-spontaneous. Right. So for this reaction to occur, you're going to have to plug it into the wall, get some sort of electricity, heat, outside influence, okay? A non-spontaneous cell reaction won't occur without outside intervention of some sort. And if I went through that too quickly, you can download the notes from online. You can have this exact stuff. It's already posted online as well. All right, you do this one. Here's a reaction. And you determine if it's spontaneous. So let's see what everybody came up with. First thing you want to do is balance the redox and figure out how many electrons were transferred here. This one's easy to deal with. There's no number to multiply by, right? That's a gain of two electrons, that's a loss of two electrons. So plus two, plus, or plus two, and plus two, right? So that means that the copper two gets reduced and the iron gets oxidized. Already balanced, so it's easy redox to deal with. Neutral solution. Now we just calculate E cell, the red cat, right? The reduction occurs at the cathode, the oxidation occurs at the anode. So from our chart, we can get our values. Our standard reduction potential for the cathode is 0.34 volts, which is right there. And for the anode, it's negative 0.44 volts, right there. And so cathode minus anode gives us E cell of 0.78 volts. Do we agree? Now based on that, you can conclude if it's spontaneous, but we want to take it even further. If we just had this to go off of though, like on Monday, 
Will we conclude that that's spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Spontaneous, and delta G should confirm that. So let's see if it does. Plugging into delta G, number of moles transferred is two. That's the number we crossed out. N is Faraday's constant. E cell we just calculated. Negative of a positive gives me a negative. Right, you've got a negative delta G and a positive E cell. So we can confirm that this is a spontaneous cell. Right, a spontaneous cell is called a galvanic or a voltaic cell. If you have a positive E cell, you should always get a negative delta G, right? Because the negative of a positive is a negative. If you have a negative E cell, you should get a positive delta G because the negative of a negative is a positive. So those two should always be opposite. We feel pretty good about doing this? Is it enough? All right, why don't you try this one? It's in line notation. It's a review of Monday. Calculate delta G for this electrochemical cell and decide if it's spontaneous. Let's go over this one. Now it's in line notation. So we talked about how to break down line notation on Monday, right? Which side of the double bar has the anode reaction? Left or right? Mm. The anode reaction is on the left, right? And the cathode reaction is on the right. So it's already broken up into your half reactions for you. You just have to go through and do the arithmetic. So because this is the anode reaction on the left, that means that CD is being oxidized and SN is being reduced, right? And then this is zero to plus two, this is plus two to zero. So again, two electrons both times, no brain busting in terms of figuring out number of electrons. And so we calculate E cell from looking at our table. Right? The anode reaction has a negative 0 0.403 volts, and the cathode reaction has a negative 0.136 volts. Again, these are coming from my table. Right? Even if it's an oxidation, I still have to look up the reduction version of it, since my table only contains reductions. And then it's just cathode minus anode to get E cell, so that's positive 0.267. Based solely on that, we could conclude that this is what? Spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Spontaneous, but let's go on and calculate delta G just to confirm. So we calculate delta G, negative number of moles transferred times Faraday's constant times E cell, which we just calculated. Remember that a volt is the same thing as a joule per coulomb. That's how we were able to make this substitution. So that my coulombs cancel, leaves me with units of joules. If you wanted to turn this into kilojoules, just divide by a thousand. Right? We got a positive delta, I mean, excuse me, we got a negative delta G and a positive E cell. So yes, both of these lead us to conclude that this is a spontaneous reaction. Now again, this is under what kind of conditions? What does that tell you? Occurring under standard conditions, right? 25 degrees Celsius, concentration of all substances is one molar. Now let's just review something. We learned when the equilibrium delta G equals zero, that we learned that about three weeks ago. We also learned back in February, uh, yeah, February, that at equilibrium Q, what's Q, uppercase Q? The reaction quotient equals K, what's big K? The equilibrium constant, right? So this is, plugging in our initial concentrations. This is plugging in equilibrium concentrations. We're at equilibrium, these two values equal each other. Also, the thermodynamic definition of equilibrium is that delta G equals zero, right? Just a review of things that we've talked about a few weeks ago, up to a couple months ago. At equilibrium, E cell equals zero. Okay, so you have a dead battery, it's at equilibrium, right? So when E cell equals zero, that means that your cell reaction is at equilibrium, right? Your battery's dead, doesn't work. Gotta discard it or find a way to make it workable again, which is a non-spontaneous process, which is why you plug it into the wall. So, so far we've only dealt with standard conditions, right? 25 degrees Celsius and one molar concentration. But the vast majority of our batteries are not one molar concentrations, okay? They're just not. 
and they're significantly different from one molar. So these are not standard conditions when you are working on the battery in your phone, for instance. And so we need to calculate cell potential under non-standard conditions. And so we use the Nernst equation. It looks kind of nasty, but it's really not that bad. So we've got two E cells to deal with. This is E cell under non-standard potential, uh, non-standard conditions. Right? So our cell potential at non-standard conditions. This would be E cell under standard conditions. How would you get this? How do you get this value? This is what you're solving for. You can't have one equation with two unknowns, right? So how do you get this value? From the chart, right? Just from our chart, because our chart is at standard conditions. Our chart's at 25 degrees Celsius, one molar. So cathode minus anode, right? So this is what we've been doing since Monday. R, okay, R is just a constant, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. T is our Kelvin temperature. N is number of moles transferred, right? So whatever our number cancels out to be, so if it's five, if it's 10, if it's three, if it's two, what, whatever that ends up being. F is still Faraday's constant, 96485 joules per, I mean, excuse me, coulombs per mole electron. Natural log of Q, where Q is the equilibrium quotient, or the reaction quotient, I should say, not equilibrium quotient. The reaction quotient. I should say reaction quotient. Which again, you'll have to calculate. And I'd have to give you those concentrations to plug in, right? Because all the ones we've done so far have been under standard conditions, which means the molarity is one mole per liter, right? So because we're not under one mole per liter, I'd have to tell you what those concentrations are so that you could plug them in, okay? So if you see me giving you a whole bunch of molarities, that should immediately think, aha, I've got to use the Nernst equation, right? Because if you see you're at a temperature other than 25 and you see that I've given you a whole bunch of molarities, that should immediately alarms be going off in your mind thinking, okay, this is not standard conditions. I can't do it the simple way, I've gotta do it the more involved way, okay? So, if you're at a temperature other than 25 degrees Celsius and you see me giving you a whole bunch of molarities, that should scream, use the Nernst equation, okay? Because that's not standard state. We have to figure out what it is under non-standard conditions, all right? Is everybody cool on what all these variables mean? Everybody good on the constant on the variables? Now the math isn't that bad either. So let's go through it. You calculate E cell under standard conditions, unless for some reason I just happen to give it to you. You know, so for instance, if I said at standard state the cell potential is blah blah blah, but you know me, I'm mean. I'd probably make you calculate it because I'm just a mean, terrible person. Calculate Q. So think back to our equilibrium studies, All right? You're gonna write an equilibrium expression, plug in our concentrations, and then figure out by how many electrons are transferred by looking at your half reactions. And then it's all for East cell under standard, non-standard conditions. So let's do this one. E cell under standard conditions is 1.76 volts. So I was being nice here, right? I gave you what E cell is under standard conditions. And I've given you the balanced equation, and I told you these concentrations. And I ask you, all right, what's the cell potential at 45 degrees Celsius? So anytime you see a whole bunch of concentrations listed out, and you look at the temperature and it's not 25 degrees, you should immediately say, hey, I gotta use the Nernst equation here, all right? Now I did happen to calculate E cell for you already, 1.76 volts. Will I always do that? You know me, probably not, right? Will I always balance the equation for you? No, right? But I figured this is an example on using this part. I'm assuming you can already do this part, right? So let's go through how we would solve this problem. 
Again, keep in mind, if I give you a whole bunch of molarities, your immediate thought should be Nernst equation, right? Because if you see that the molarity is given, then obviously it's not one mole per liter, right? And if I don't give you molarity, then you should assume it is one mole, one mole per liter. Make sense? Everyone with me on why we're using the Nernst equation here? All right. Well then, let's go through it. So calculate E cell uh, under standard conditions. So that would be using our handout, right? We'd have to figure out who gets oxidized, who gets reduced, what's the cathode, what's the reduction, and subtract them, right? But I already gave you E cell under standard conditions. So just FYI, right? If E cell under standard conditions is not given, you would have to calculate it using the method that we learned on Monday. Okay, so if you're out and about and you don't have this with you, just search it on the internet. You'll have a thousand of them at your disposal. There's also one in the back of your textbook. Now we're going to calculate Q, which, remind, which makes us think back to our equilibrium days. So what would the equilibrium expression be? Think back to our equilibrium days. Right, products over reactants, and what do we do with any coefficients? How does a coefficient factor in? Squared or cubed or to the fifth or whatever, right? Are there any of these that we can ignore in our Q expression? The solid and the liquid, right? Solids and liquids don't participate in the equilibrium. And it's products over reactants, right? So it would be concentration of VO2 plus squared, right, thinking back to equilibrium, times the concentration of Zn2 plus divided by the concentration of VO2 plus, what do I do with it? Square it, right, times the concentration of H plus, what do we do with it? To the fourth. Now again, I gave you the balanced reaction already. It was balanced to begin with. Don't expect me to give you a balanced one in the future though, right? I expect you to be able to balance it. But you're gonna plug in those coefficients as superscripts, yes? And then all we have to do is plug in the molarities that were given to me in the problem. So 0 0.01 squared times 0.1 divided by 2 squared times 0.5 to the fourth. Does everyone see where these numbers are coming from? I didn't just make them up, right? These problem, these are given to me in the problem. Okay, I didn't just pull these numbers out of the sky. The problem told me what these molarities were. That's where they're coming from. Okay, so I didn't have to calculate any of these molarities. They were given to me. Again, if you see a whole big long list of molarities, you should say to yourself, yep, I definitely have to use the Nernst equation. So when you do your number crunching, you get four times 10 to the negative fifth. That's the value of Q. Q has what units? It's got the same units as K, so what units would that be? It's unitless, right, it's unitless. Is everyone with me on how we calculated Q? Have I lost anyone here? Okay, now let's figure out how many electrons were transferred. I gave you the balanced equation. So in some ways, that's kind of a disadvantage because if I gave it to you balanced, you're still going to have to go back and figure out what happened to get to it to be balanced, right? This is uh, going from plus 5 to plus 4. This is going from 0 to plus 2. Notice there are coefficients of 2 to get this to be two, this is already a loss of two, right? So in some ways, it kind of hurts you having to be given the balanced equation because you still have to go back and break it up into its half reactions in order to figure out number of electrons that were transferred. So even if you do have the balanced equation, sometimes it's kind of more work because you still got to go back and figure out your number of electrons. And the only way you can do that is by looking at your half reactions, right? Unless you can just do it in your head and say, okay, 
plus five to plus four with a coefficient of two, so that makes this two. Zero to plus two, that's two, right? So two and two, therefore it's two. Does everybody see how we got number of moles of electrons transferred? Looking at our half reactions. Okay, now all we need to do is our arithmetic. So this is what we're solving for. This is cell potential under non-standard conditions. So at those molarities and at 45 degrees Celsius, this is a cell potential under standard conditions, which I happen to give you here. And then we're just plugging and chugging for the rest. So 1.76 minus R is a constant. Convert Celsius to Kelvin, right? Number of moles transferred, Faraday's constant. Natural log of Q that we solved for just a minute ago. So when we do our reduction, 1.76 is what it would be under standard conditions, but being at non-standard conditions made it become 1.9. Okay, so you can actually kind of compare. When I changed the temperature and I changed the molarity, what did that do? It increased the cell potential. And I've got, I can get greater voltage at these non-standard conditions than I could at standard conditions. Sometimes, playing around with stuff actually will make your cell potential go down. It'll make it worse. Maybe it'll make it non-spontaneous. Okay? Do we see how to do this? Yes? Questions on how we do the arithmetic? Have I lost anyone in the math? Ready to try one for yourself? All right. I've given you the E cell under standard conditions, and I've already balanced the equation for you, too. So, what's the cell potential at 25 degrees Celsius? Now, you might say to yourself, hey, I don't need to use the Nernst equation. I'm at 25 degrees Celsius. Why is that wrong? Are these standard concentrations? No. So even if you're at a standard temperature, these are not standard concentrations. Okay? So this is why we still have to use the Nernst equation. I'll pause the recording and give you a few minutes to think about this one. All right. Let's go over this one. Oops. That's recording, right? Yes. Hit the wrong button. Okay, so I gave you E-cell under standard conditions. I gave you a balanced reaction. I asked you for cell potential at 25 degrees Celsius. 25 degrees Celsius is a standard temperature, but these are not standard concentrations, right? Anytime you see concentrations other than one mole per liter or any temperature other than 25, right, you got to do the Nernst equation. This is not standard molarity, so I've got to use the Nernst equation. So the problem gave me E cell, but I could have calculated it. Cathode minus anode, right? I could have done that very easily. Calculate Q. So coefficient of two comes out as a superscript of two. Coefficient of three comes out as a superscript of three. I omit my two solids from my Q expression. So Q is 18. Do we agree on Q? How many electrons get transferred here? Well, we've got to look at our half reactions in order to figure that out. Or you could just do it in your head, right? I already gave it to you balanced. So if you didn't want to write out your half reactions, you could just do it in your head. MN2 plus going to MN, that's a gain of two electrons times three. Two times three is six, right? AL going to AL3 plus, that's a loss of three electrons times two is six. So even if you didn't want to write this out, if you wanted to just do it in your head, you could have done that. Right, number of moles of electrons transferred is six. Do we agree on N value? Yes? Okay, so now we just do the arithmetic. This is the number we're solving for. This was given in the problem. This is a constant. This is our temperature. This is number of moles of electrons. This is Faraday's constant. We just calculated Q. So changing that concentration actually made my cell potential go down. Right? This is what it would have been if it were under standard conditions. Modifications made it go down. So it actually lowered my cell potential. I get lesser current under these non-standard conditions than I would have otherwise. Right? So sometimes modifications make it better, make it have a higher current, and sometimes it doesn't. Do we agree on the answer, 0.47? 
Any questions on how we get this? All right, let's talk about electrolysis. So, so far, all the cell reactions we've been doing have been spontaneous, right? They have a positive E cell and a negative delta G, and those are called galvanic or voltaic cells, right? Galvanic cells are the same thing as voltaic cells. They are used interchangeably, so don't let that confuse you. Whereas an electrolytic cell is a chemical cell that is non-spontaneous, okay? So it's going to have a negative E cell and a positive delta G. Electrolytic cells require some sort of energy to do their job, okay? They're non-spontaneous. E cell's negative, delta G's positive. So you've got to force current, right? Plug it in for this to happen. So galvanic cells, on the other hand, same thing as voltaic cells, right? This is spontaneous. This one is non-spontaneous. This one does not require electricity. You don't have to plug in your beakers to the wall, right? Tomorrow in lab, you're not going to be plugging into the wall to get your cell to work. If we were doing an electrolytic cell, however, you would. Yeah, you would. You would have to be given an outside push because it's a non-spontaneous cell reaction. Do we understand the difference between electrolytic cells and galvanic slash voltaic cells, right? Galvanic is the same thing as voltaic. Do we understand the difference between them thermodynamically and practically? One requires electricity, one doesn't. Right? So here would be a spontaneous cell reaction. Even if I didn't give this to you, even if I didn't identify which one was which, you should be able to just by looking at it. How? How, Dr. Brock? How could you figure that out? Well, electrons spontaneously flow from anode to cathode, right? Because they're being generated at the anode, so they spontaneously flow in this direction. So you should be able to look at this and tell, hey, that's spontaneous. That makes it a galvanic cell. Whereas here, look at the direction the electrons are flowing. It is flowing anode to cathode. However, look at our power source, right? This is spontaneous, getting a current of 1.1 volts. This one requires a uh, power source greater than 1.1 volts. Cathode, anode, right? This is a non-spontaneous process. That would be in the, our electrolytic cell. Okay, so electrolysis. And electrolytic cells require outside help. This is what I just said, because they don't occur spontaneously. So electroplating is something that we can do to deposit a metal, right? Because when you're doing this, whether it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous, you're going to have metal accumulating on our plates, right? You're going to have metal accumulating on the plate here. So electroplating is a way that you can take an ion and deposit it as a solid onto um, one of your plates. So you're taking something out of solution and making it a metal. So for instance, when you make chrome, now chrome is a mixture, but when you make chrome, right, you're taking something out of solution and getting it into the solid phase, applying electricity to do that. <coughs> Excuse me, because it's non-spontaneous. So, Pull out your chart, we can talk about what's called relative oxidizing ability. So if you look at your chart, you look at your standard reduction potentials chart, the more positive the E cell and then the standard reduction potential value, the more the reaction has a tendency to proceed. What does that mean? We can predict the order that we could plate these ions out, okay? So by looking at our E cell value, or looking at our standard reduction potentials, if I've got a mixture of ions, I can predict which one can be plated out first. Just like if I have a mixture of ions, I can look at KSP values to predict which one will precipitate out first, right? KSP would allow me to do that, okay? Our standard reduction potentials chart, if I have a mixture of ions, will allow me to predict which ones I can electroplate out and in what order. So let's look at this one. A solution in an electrolytic cell contains these ions. And so we have a very low voltage. Remember, this requires us to put forth effort. This is something that's occurring non-spontaneously. So I've got a mixture. I've got an electrolytic cell with these ions in it. 
and I've got some sort of power source plugged into the well, and I initially just have zero volts, and I just start increasing the voltage. Which ones will be plated out first? What's the order? So the way you do that is you look up your cell potentials. Now, page A34 just depends on which textbook you are in. Right? That's where, what page it's on in your appendix. But you've got it on your handout there. So 0 0.34, 0 0.8, 0 0.0, negative 0 0.76. More positive means more likely to occur. In other words, this will occur, this will occur, this will occur. Which one's most likely to occur? You pick the one with the highest E value. So which one will happen first? The one with the highest E cell. Right, so this reaction, silver metal gets electroplated out first. Then copper metal gets electroplated out second. And then zinc metal gets electroplated out third. Does everyone see how we predicted the order here? The larger the standard reduction potential, the higher it is on our priority list of who's happening first, right? So you pick the biggest one, that one comes first, second one, third one, All right? So I would make, I would observe on my plate, I'd see silver metal first, and then on top of that, I'd see the copper metal, and then on top of that, I'd see the zinc metal. Does this make sense? All right, you try this one. An, an acidic solution in an electrolytic cell contains these three ions. I want to know which one can I get out at the lowest voltage. Let's just rephrase that. Let's list them in the order that they'll come out. Let's just rephrase that. Predict which will be reduced at the lowest voltage. I don't like the way that's worded. Let's just predict the order that they will be electroplated. I'll pause the recording and let you try that. All right, last problem of the day. Predicting the order that these are going to come out of solution by electroplating. So we look up our standard reduction potentials from our handout. 1.7 negative 1.18, so 1.7, negative 1.18, and 0.77, there we go. So, what's the order? We're just going off our numbers, right? One, two, three. Do we agree? Questions before we begin, before we end? Oh boy, wouldn't that be a nightmare? Okay, we're starting all over again. Okay, well, that's where we will stop for today. I'll see you tomorrow for lab. Have a good day.